This is day five of reading Revelation. I looked again and heard the voices of many angels who surrounded the throne and the living creatures and the elders. They were countless in number, and they cried out in a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches, wisdom and strength, honor and glory and blessing. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea, everything in the universe, cry out, To the one who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor, glory and might forever and ever. The four living creatures answered, Amen, and the elders fell down and worshipped. Then I watched while the Lamb broke open the first of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures cry out in a voice like thunder, Come forward! I looked, and there was a white horse, and its rider had a bow. He was given a crown, and he rode forth victorious to further his victories. When he broke open the second seal, I heard the second living creature cry out, Come forward! Another horse came out, a red one. Its rider was given power to take peace away from the earth, so that people would slaughter one another, and he was given a huge sword. When he broke open the third seal, I heard the living creature cry out, Come forward! I looked, and there was a black horse, and its rider held a scale in his hand. I heard what seemed to be a voice in the midst of the four living creatures. It said, A ration of wheat costs a day's pay, and three rations of barley cost a day's pay. But do not damage the olive oil or the wine. When he broke open the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature cry out, Come forward! I looked, and there was a pale green horse. Its rider was named Death, and Hades accompanied him. They were given authority over a quarter of the earth to kill with sword, famine, and plague, and by means of the beasts of the earth. When he broke open the fifth seal, I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who had been slaughtered because of the witness they bore to the word of God. They cried out in a loud voice, How long will it be, holy and true master, before you sit in judgment and avenge our blood on the inhabitants of the earth? Each of them was given a white robe, and they were told to be patient a little while longer, until the number was filled of their fellow servants and brothers who were going to be killed as they had been. Then I watched while he broke open the sixth seal, and there was a great earthquake. The sun turned as black as dark sackcloth, and the whole moon became like blood. The stars in the sky fell to the earth like unripe figs, shaken loose from the tree in a strong wind. Then the sky was divided like a torn scroll curling up, and every mountain and island was moved from its place. The kings of the earth, the nobles, the military officers, the rich, the powerful, and every slave and free person hid themselves in caves and among mountain crags. They cried out as the mountains cried out to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of the one who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, because the great day of their wrath has come, and who can withstand it? With the glorious image of the throne room of God still active in our imagination, we move on into the part of Revelation where the images become more troubling. Today is the, the beginning of the ominous vision of the breaking of the seals. I think it's worth asking right from the beginning what sort of document might be sealed up, might be closed up in this way if we understand it somehow to involve the will of God or the, the plan of God for the world, it's worth asking, why is it closed? And what do these seals mean? Why is it that the breaking of the seals seems to bring tribulation to the world? It's not entirely clear in the way the writer describes it, uh, but clearly something is happening that is a dam breaking. There, there has been something coming in the way of judgment of the world and the world's imperfections, the evil that rules the world uh, that now can no longer be held back. There is, of course, a temptation rising here to try to connect what happens from here on in the story with current events. We should probably resist that. 
there's no reason to suppose that any specific piece of the vision connects with any specific event in the world. And we get into pretty deep water it, the minute we begin to try to say, well, this means this, but that doesn't really mean that. We end up cherry picking the ones that we think we can see, the ones that we want to see, rather than looking at the entirety of the picture. This is the piece of Revelation where we come upon the four horsemen of the apocalypse. There have been many interpretations of them over the centuries. And in fact, what they are said to represent has changed over the centuries. You may now know that now it's war, famine, pestilence, and death. That wasn't always the case. And in fact, uh, artists have chosen to interpret these images in a variety of ways that suggest a variety of pieces of uh, the sadness and brokenness and imperfection that seem to haunt human life. And that probably is a better way to look at these images and a better underlying message to take away. That the basic problems of life are somehow always with us. And that we should note that once these seals are open, they stay open. There's no resealing of anything. And so when the four horsemen are released, they are in the world and there's probably not much reason to suppose that they will ever uh, not be with us. Looking specifically at horseman number three, who is usually described as famine, uh, you'll note that in the way that that particular horseman is described is a reference to the value of goods. And one commentator notes that the prices that are given in what the writer describes here are about 10 times what would have been normal at the time. So these necessities of life are being described as, as excessively expensive, as, as exorbitant in their price. I think this may be a way of suggesting a, a distinction between the necessities and the luxuries of life and the injustice that perhaps the luxuries are available to those who can afford them, but even the necessities are out of the range, out of the, the, the means of those who must have them. Things like the flour to make bread. Interestingly, wine and oil are also in this image, but are, are described as things that are not to be touched. Does that mean that somehow those who can afford things that seem perhaps like luxuries will continue to be able to have them, and that may be a, a, a temporary sign of the injustice of the world, or is there something else going on? One commentator suggests that maybe the wine and the oil could represent the Christians, because we use wine and oil in our sacraments. So, for as many ominous and troubling interpretations as there are of these scenes, there are others that are perhaps uh, more encouraging or more reassuring. When the fifth seal is open, we see the gathering of souls, and those who have already been gathered, who, are, who already have been uh, killed for their faith, and who have uh, been brought to the, 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 the presence of God, the safety of heaven, are told they have to wait a little longer. So even this must be complete. Everything in God must be complete and not all the souls who are those who will be saved in this way have yet been brought to God's mercy. With the sixth seal, when it's opened, we see that the action of God is, is earth-shaking. Here again, we have an image that we came upon earlier, that when this happens, when God acts in this way and in this time, we are reassured that it will be apparent to absolutely everyone, the good and the bad. And so there will be no hiding it. There will be no denying it. Once again, there's the temptation here for faithful people to imagine a kind of vindication over against those who have scoffed and those who have been skeptical. Probably not wise to go too far in that direction. Uh, but certainly the idea that God is the God of everything everywhere all the time is important and that God's action must necessarily impact all of creation if God really is the ruler and creator of everything. So to sum up what we get out of this 
first and not most troubling of the visions in Revelation, I think we, we really should remember that all is in the hands of Christ. Remember, this, this vision begins with Jesus with the scroll in his hand. It's Jesus who opens the seals. So everything is in the hands of one whom we trust, who has made very clear that he loves us and desires that we should all be saved. So there ought not to be too much fear for those who trust in Jesus, for those who trust in the salvation of God. And we also see that the power of God will have no limits. There will be nothing that is safe from the transforming power of God, the purifying power of God, the power of God to set all things right and to overthrow those systems of this world that appear to work, but that in reality serve to do nothing other than create greater injustice. <laughs> Oh, yeah.